I am going to be moderating this panel. My name again is Tomas McCabe. I'm the Associate Director of Strategic Initiatives at Burning Man. And uh, prior to this, uh, prior to making Burning Man a nonprofit, I was the Executive Director of the Black Rock Arts Foundation for seven years. And um, we have a really cool panel to wrap up today. I'd like to introduce them and invite them up right now. Judy Nemzoff is a program director from the San Francisco Arts Commission. Hello, Judy. And uh, we have Matthew Passmore of Moore Labs. He was uh, one of the creators of Rebar back in the day, if you know Parking Day. <laughs> Hi, Matthew. We also have um, Jonathan Moscone. He's the chief of civic engagement at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Hello, Jonathan. And finally, Peter Hirschberg. Peter, are you here? There he is. Welcome, Peter. And Peter is CEO of Reimagine Group, or is it Regarding Imagine Group? All right, thank you. <coughs> so um, I'm just going to set the context for this, this discussion. And um, I have a couple of panelists that, that decided they wanted to do a quick little five minute presentation but we really want to bring it back to discussion, so um, I'll keep it brief. And um, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, in, in the, my years of working with the Black Rock Arts Foundation and now Burning Man, I've, I've had the opportunity to engage in a lot of public art projects. And, you know, the, the demand seems to be growing around the world and in different cities around the United States, especially where people, municipalities and different organizations are like looking to Burning Man. They see what we do, they see how we engage, with artists and community, and they want that in their communities. And <clears throat> you know, the unique thing about Burning Man Art is, you know, quite often people are learning welding skills and collaborating on the projects. Quite often they're interactive, so people can collaborate with them and interact with them uh, after the piece is finished. The next piece, which I think is ex extra challenging, is actually working with communities and working with the people of the communities outside of Burning Man to create artwork. And I had the opportunity to, um, to receive, through the Black Rock Arts Foundation, two National Endowment for the Arts grants to do such projects. And the NEA really pushed us and challenged us to really engage community. And it's a lot harder than it is to engage burners, because in the Burning Man world, it's like, hey, we're making a big piece of art, come help. It's like, hell yeah, I'll help, and then we'll all go to Burning Man. You know, it's different when you're in community. So, it really challenged us, but I gotta say, those two projects, um, the bike bridge, there it is, was the first project we did, and I collected 150 junk bikes and gave them to the Crucible, and the Crucible had a, a summer-long program with 12 young women from seven different Oakland high schools, and they got to work with artist Michael Christian to re-envision these junk bikes into this large-scale sculpture, which we then put in downtown Oakland for a year or two uh, before it went to Burning Man. And now it lives in Gerlach, Nevada. But to see the impact on these girls and to have the girls work with the artist, not just to make the art, but to conceive of the art and to design it was really incredible. And the girls all felt ownership of it and the opening was amazing. The second example I have is <clears throat> in Fernley, Nevada. You can go to the next slide. Um, we got a grant where we had to work with a small town in Nevada, and the city of uh, Fernley stepped up to the plate, and they're like, we want to do this. So it was a partnership with us and them. We put out a, a request for proposals to create a brand new art piece that would be permanent in their community. And we didn't tell them who the artists were, where they were from. We had submissions from New York and other places. They picked this desert tortoise. It turns out there's a desert tortoise. Um, in the desert there that's going extinct. And it turned out that that was the only local artist that submitted. And what he did is he worked with every single school kid in a city of 19,000 people to make the carapace of this tortoise. And each, the carapace had individual tiles, here they are, made by the local skill kids. And um, I don't know if you've been to Fernley, Nevada, but they're pretty right wing and Republican. And we put together a citizen committee to vote on which piece would be there. Of these 12 people, only one person had been to Burning Man, yet all 12 of them were born and raised in Fernley. 
which is the closest city to, to the Black Rock Desert where we held uh, Burning Man. And when we were building the first sculpture, uh, people were driving by in their trucks going, we're going to burn down your stupid art. And we're like, oh no, what have we gotten into? But I was in a Home Depot there with La Legna, if anybody knows her, she's a beautiful, tall, African-American woman, and we were shopping for some supplies, and a couple guys turned the corner in, this, in, the, in the Home Depot there, and this one guy's like really snide, he's like, you're those burners putting up that art, aren't you? And the guy standing next to him, his buddy's like, yeah, my son is actually working on that, and he's got a piece on that. And it completely changed the attitude of both those guys. And so with that, I will, uh, we'll, we'll continue after the presentations to talk about what is civic engagement, what is community art. So um, who's first? I think I know that. Um, Matthew Passmore. So I'd like to introduce Matthew Passmore. This is one of my early pieces. This is uh, Half Dome. <laughs> Um, yeah, so yes, my name is Matthew Passmore. I run a studio now called More Lab. Uh, we're based in Oakland. Before that, I ran a studio called Rebar that was based in San Francisco. And Rebar disbanded a few years ago and became Gale Studio, which Anna Musig, who was just speaking, uh, was a part of. Uh, and to continue on the sort of artistic practice and the conceptual uh, aims of Rebar, I formed a new studio uh, to continue that. Um, so we can keep the slides sort of moving in the interest of time. Um, so our work looks at the sort of the social uh, and political dynamics of public space and how people use public space. Uh, in addition to using some of the sort of common symbolic materials you might see uh, around a city, uh, including railroad track and parking meters. Uh, also using inflatables to explore the social dynamics and to sort of increase the range, the spectrum of acceptable behavior. Uh, in public space, and also using niche spaces and sort of activating these smaller niche spaces. Okay, we should probably slow down here. This is where it gets interesting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but in terms of uh, a, a case study of a, maybe a successful uh, community-based art project, um, I want to tell you the story of parking that became Parking Day. Uh, if, if I or Rebar was a band, uh, this would have been the hit single on our first album that came out eight years ago. <laughs> And uh, we've had many records since, yet uh, I, I continue to speak about this one. So, so Parking Day began as parking, a single uh, temporary installation in a metered parking space on Mission Street um, on the precept that uh, a parking space is an offer for a lease from the city. And you can pay the fee, right? You feed the meter. Uh, and you can do a range of other activities within that space other than just storing your private automobile. Um, so we had this armed with this map uh, that we got from the Department of City Planning, if you want to advance. Uh, we located a site in downtown San Francisco that lacked green space. And there, for two hours, we created a public park with living grass and a tree and a bench. Uh, and made some iconic images of this, and it became this sort of viral thing, uh, this meme that traveled the internet. Um, and people came to us asking us to replicate this project in their city. And the truth was it took a couple of emails, a couple of beers, and about $200. Um, <clears throat> so to uh, sort of accommodate this response, we created this how-to manual. And we started sending out this manual to people saying, listen, do the project yourself. Um, just there's two requirements. Give us credit for the concept. And don't use it for any commercial purposes, right? You really have to make this a sort of an act of generosity, an act of sort of civic participation uh, on your part. Um, and so in 2006, that first parking installation was November 2005. Beginning in 2006, we started to accumulate all of this interest onto a single day to make a global statement about, you know, how cities use public space, how much of the city is sort of uncritically handed over to the automobile to move and store it. Uh, and the project sort of blossomed. We used websites and other social media techniques, uh, and this is a map, I think, from 2011 or so. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here's just some of the diverse installations beyond just public parks. People were doing a range of activities in parking spaces. Uh, this is one in uh, Seoul, South Korea. And this is probably my favorite. This is in Tehran uh, in 2010. 
Um, some very bold urban designers down there decided to participate. Um, and we, you know, were missing out on all the parks around San Francisco, so we took uh, our park on the road a few years ago. This is the Park Cycle, which is a pedal-powered park, uh, funded actually by the Black Rock Arts Foundation. Uh, and then in 2011, which is the last year, we tried to count how many participants there were globally. Uh, you can see that really what began in a single metered parking space in downtown San Francisco really has blossomed into this, uh, this global phenomenon. Uh, and so this is where the, the, the story gets sort of interesting, where we start to meet, or more interesting to me, where we start to meet up with the bureaucracy and the, the sort of the powers that be in the city. And as part of its Pavement to Parks program, uh, the Department of City Planning created this idea of the sort of turning parking day into an annual renewable permit system called the parklet, right? So the parklets you see around San Francisco uh, were inspired by Parking Day and a, a, a single city planner named Andres Power uh, at the time was working in city planning uh, really innovated quite a bit within the bureaucracy of the city to develop uh, a program by which people could now make a sort of durable Parking Day type installation in front of their business or their home or whatever. Uh, wait, can you say what? I'll cue you. Yeah, back up one please. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> Okay, one forward. In an interesting parallel to Parking Day, uh, the Department of City Planning started to receive all of these inquiries on how they did it and, and what people could do. And they found themsel themselves, much as I did, answering the same dozen or so questions. So like we did with our Parking Day manual, uh, the city created its Parklet manual and started sending this around to, to uh, cities around, around the country. Okay, next one. And now you can see that just like Parking Day, parklet programs have started to proliferate uh, around the nation and around the world. Okay. Uh, and then to me, this is where things kind of get a little fractal and, and fold back on themselves. Um, so looking at this dynamic between Parking Day and parklets, the way that this art project could be sort of absorbed uh, by the city uh, permit systems, uh, Gray Area Foundation and Intersection for the Arts and the City developed an urban prototyping festival, right? Not necessarily inspired by Parking Day, but inspired by this dynamic, this idea that art projects coming from the art and design community, community might be ways to uh, look at some of the more intractable problems that are, that are facing our city. And what if there were sort of official mechanisms through which we could look at some cool ideas uh, from the citizens and from designers and artists and see if those are, uh, you know, suitable to be developed into permit programs just like Parking Day installed parklets. And of course that's led to the Market, Day, uh, Market Street Prototyping Festival, which surely you've all heard of. It's coming back this year as well. Um, I think that's about it, yeah? Is there any more slides? That's about it. So yeah, really the story, uh, the, the sort of sum I want to tell you is that there's a way in which these small moves by artists, right, these sort of little guerrilla art projects might have ripple effects that we can't necessarily anticipate and that will end up changing the way our, our cities get made and influencing the mechanisms by which our cities get made. So don't underestimate the, the potential of what it is that you're doing as artists and designers. Thanks. Can we get uh, the presentation by Jonathan Moscone up? And with that, I want to introduce. Hey, I'm John Jonathan. Moscone. It's not. It's it's a little video about a little thing called the Market Street Prototyping <laughs> Festival. My God, we're really selling this today. I'm so sorry. No, but I think we have that right. Yes. If not, I can perform the roles of Neil Hirscholi <laughs> and Deborah Cohen. Or do you want to just yeah, set it I'm up looking, a little bit? He's going like that. All right. Um, so we are indeed. Uh, um, my job at, uh, as chief of civic engagement is such a uh, such a major name, but um, just I am helping to make real the promise of uh, Yorba Buena Center for the Arts mission to be a place that generates culture that moves people, which really requires that this organization work and move outside of its home. And uh, we are not a pre preservationist organization. We don't hold art. 
We use art for uh, dialogue, for provocation, and in the case of our work in neighborhoods, for example, our work with schools, we don't just provide arts education, we're providing civic engagement opportunities for youth to identify ways in which art and, and art making can be a catalyst for change either in their school, on their street, in their neighborhood, and ultimately because they are participants in the festival in the way the city is planned towards better market street. Uh, my father was, the first thing he ever did when he was maybe 30, yeah, was to, he helped stop the Panhandle Freeway. And he had no c capital, no uh, uh, movement behind him, but that's what started, and, and, and he did with, obviously the people he worked with, me led, he stopped the Panhandle Freeway in San Francisco in 1960. And that was the lore of my father was the beginning of his real sense of political. That he, as a, a very underprivileged uh, uh, man in San Francisco, could make change. Um, so community activism, uh, when it meets art making, I think is going to blow uh, uh, us more towards a tipping point to change policy in San Francisco. For example, even if you don't even have this, because you don't necessarily need to see it, but let me know when you have it. Um, I would say that if we're talking about success of prototyping, there's a lot of ways in which you can see success, and one of them is failure, right, which is why you do prototyping. Like, what it's like to do something, say, on the Embarcadero, in the Embarcadero, is quite different than to say when you're in six and seven on market. Oh, here's, <laughs> uh, hold that thought. Let's go watch this, all right? It's really good. And really quiet. going very well. <laughs> Thank you. And it's urban, it's busy, it's loud, it's got these beautiful buildings, there's transit going up and down, but one thing it lacks is this sense of place, this place where it's an invitation for you to stop and spend some time and just take in the scene. One of the things we want to do at the Prototyping Festival is to start giving people that invitation again, that it's okay to stop, have fun, sp spend time meet someone, learn, engage, play, and have a whole different type of experience in Market Street that you can't really do right now. street off the six and as I was coming from shopping I see this little area with boxes and music and it just stopped me. Uh, it was like it was so peaceful it really stopped me. You know that's what music does. You know it just takes you to another another place you know and this place did it to me today. My experience was like it was so joyous like which which surprised me I guess I wouldn't have used that word when I was thinking about what it would feel like. Um, I wanted to be on the street. I didn't want to miss anything. I was out there at 11 o'clock at night, playing ping pong with the son and one of his friends, and a whole bunch of people I'd never met before. I think it's bigger than public art, at least when we think about what we mean by that traditionally. I think large scale, high quality, beautifully done art is an essential component of what I think of when I think of the fabric of creativity that needs to be used to activate our streets. So for me, the prototyping festival was not about public art, and it also was. In other words, it takes designers and creators and makers and activists and kids and seniors and artists to make the street what it needs to be. It's about the idea that if our streets are full of joy and opportunity for connection um, and they really engage us, that we're going to be more likely to get involved in really tackling the biggest issues that we face. I think that we probably would be able to tie more activated street life with more people voting. I think we'd be able to tie more activated street life with more kids understanding what it takes to make a city and getting engaged as planners and urbanists. Um, I think activated street life could be tied to a lot of things. Right, so a failure of one specific prototype to uh, do 
what it was intended to do compares nothing to the aggregation of the numbers of prototype and the numbers of people who engage and how you define beauty because some of them are just naturally beautiful and then there was a beautiful thing that happened because of them, which is over a million people stopped and connected and lingered. And then beyond that, because you think, well, what's the long play in a prototype if it's a small thing, is that we went longer in Central Market and learned way more what it means to have prototypes in a very, very, very blighted area in this city. And we've iterated towards that. And then how do you incubate them, which, they ha which I'm sure Josette talked about, to make some of them more lasting? And how do you put them in? And how do you ultimately, the long play, change policy? And in San Francisco, the way San Francisco planning addresses ideas along every neighborhood in the street has been deeply informed from the thing that Peter started and Matthew and Josette and everybody, one by one, they added up to an actual change in civic policy. To me, that's the big success of this. And it's not a success as in aren't we awesome, but it's, it's a success saying that um, collective action creates movement, movement changes culture, and culture's right before policy. And that's what we just have to keep small ideas thinking towards the long play. So that's all I wanted to share. Excellent. <laughs> Next, I want to introduce um, someone that I had the distinct pleasure of working with. Um, Judy Nemzoff helped uh, Karen Cusolito bring a couple of her gigantic flowers to the mid-market area for, uh, I think it was up for about a year. And um, she's deeply engaged in, in the community, community art. And um, so thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Um, I work for the city. I did not get it together to get the slides in. So, but <laughs> um, this, uh, there's another aspect of community arts that I would like to talk about. And certainly, um, I'm very fortunate to work at a city agency that does everything from the um, bunnies from Tanz um, that were just up in Civic Center Plaza for that kind of wonderful short term, major installations of public art, support of incredible projects like these that have. Um, so much impact on civic space. But the program that I run has very, it has roots um, in what was called the Neighborhood Arts Program. And I want to talk about that a little bit because it's a different way of doing, of, of being engaged in community that is a little bit of a twist on what we're talking about here. I loved um, the pr previous speaker mentioned something about plop art. Um, I. I come from a background and the program that I run is about engaging community where the community lives and where the community works. And I, that is um, a different kind of engagement than the kind of wonderful um, kind of mystery and awe that happens when you stumble across something. But it's about a way of working with, as an artist, as an arts collective, as a designer, deeply rooted in, in a community, which is where I believe the stewardship of, of our great city actually comes from. So we're talking about artists who are working in neighborhood and community settings. This is deep, long-term work. It's the kind of work that takes place. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. There's a project at Sixth and Market called Skywalkers. Um, it's a woman named Ann Bleithenthal who has been a dancer for many, many years in San Francisco and started through the luggage store teaching in a um, low-income housing with residents who were formerly homeless. And they actually are making the art and performing the art out on the street. There is a kind of way in which that kind of work is the placekeeping aspect that is different than the place making aspect. And I really think that it's something that I want to challenge every artist to think about. Um, I think that if we only focus in our downtown high visibility, there's it, it, the work is wonderful, but we can't forget our neighbors. We can't forget our other neighborhoods. We can't forget the young people and the residents of San Francisco who feel very disenfranchised from what takes place in our civic center area. And I think for me, it's critically important that every neighborhood in our city, every constituent, every community, whether it's youth, whether it's seniors, have an opportunity. Um, again, on the federal level, it's placekeeping. How can we make art that moves people, that has an impact in the civic realm, but also engages local residents to actually 
so that it becomes a participatory and not just um, a participatory in a long term and not just uh, a let's go downtown and see something. So I kind of want to be a little provocative today to have get people to think a little bit about what it means to really deeply engage with members of community um, in a way that's different than just um, kind of a weekend of observation and engagement and joy. I, I don't mean at all to take anything away from it. I just want to provoke people to think about what it means to work deeply, deeply in a community setting. Great, thank you. <laughs> all right, and so, finally, Peter Hirschberg. I, I had the pleasure of being on a panel with him at Burning Man, of all places. Yeah, the, there's panels at Burning Man. Go figure. Um, Peter's deeply involved with studying all, uh, everything that we've been talking about and the maker movement and has a lot to say, and I'm just going to let you take off. It's been quite an odyssey. Uh, Josette and I co-founded Gray Area, what, about eight years ago or so, and then found ourselves in this kind of whole civic engagement field and working with the city and working with Burning Man, the first thing to acknowledge is this really amazing dialogue between the Burner community and San Francisco in, in kind of researching and figuring out all these forms of engagement. The amazing thing about Burning Man is there's such a sense of agency. That city only gets built because people, you know, it's kind of like in, at Burning Man, you're Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses all at once. You have a responsibility to build a great city and you get to go, go build it with the, like the least rules and the most freedom of anywhere. And that, that brings back to our city people who audaciously believe they can do urban prototyping or create uh, the bay lights or all these other functions. And so in many ways, it's, there's a lot of documenting what we're learning and being able to share that with people. I was in, uh, and, and the other kind of interesting project going on right now is there's a, uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, the White House convened a White House Makers Fair. So about 100 cities kind of took a pledge and said, we're gonna work on maker spaces and STEM education and art. And, and, and this is really part of kind of, how does America reinvent herself at a time when manufacturing is coming back and old ways don't, don't, don't work. And what you find in all of these communities is just a great deal of, of curiosity and the arts communities and maker community is kind of very fertile people to do all of this. And that's led to a project uh, that Gray Area is, uh, is, is in the lead of that, that I've been leading called the Maker City Playbook. We've worked with about 100 cities to document how all this stuff works. And one of the key things, I think, is being able to share with cities what we've learned. I went off to Pittsburgh recently and was giving a talk. Mayor Peduto realized there's a city that's competing on quality of life. And as it gets more popular and gentrified, if they don't keep the artistic energy going and if you don't have this kind of sense of life on the streets and, and, and kind of uh, serendipity engagement, you'll lose something there. And I was giving a talk on the curious case of art and economic development. I think sometimes we kind of stick art off in a corner and don't realize how vital it is as an engagement and as a, as, as a thing that kind of drives serendipity and, and interest in cities. Uh, let me go back to my notes here. Uh, the, the prototyping bit is really key. None of this would happen if anyone believed it was permanent. And uh, I mean, you know, when we first did the first urban prototyping festival, it was with a private organization. Even the city was kind of looking on before there was Market Street prototyping. And I think in the course of doing it, it was a project with 5M and it was a weekend project. And Josette spent basically, the art was figuring out how to do all the permits, right? So how do you actually get permission to put all this stuff up in the streets? And much of what I think we need to communicate to other cities, and just as we heard all of these things today about what you needed to go to do in the playa, and just as Parklets and Parking Bay kind of communicated in code what you would do to do that, a lot of how do you get permits and do these things in other cities becomes a, a big part of it. Um, there was a symposium we held when the first urban prototyping went on, and that was when I saw city, some of the city planning people were there, and you know, kind of, in social media, when social media came out, the brand managers and the journalists were very weird of the bloggers. It's like, who are these people who are creating content because we're supposed to be in charge? And of course, today, you can't, you can't build a brand or, or write something without your audience engaged. City planners and architects kind of played that role a few years later when a bunch of artists and Werner showed up and said, how about we go remake a part of town? And we 
kind of formal city planning instinct was like, no, no, we all went to school for this and there's rules. And then it was really interesting to watch as this stuff was going on, people thinking, wow, look, look how much more this opens up the conversation. So many more ideas come in. Uh, you know, you do a prototype and in the first four hours you learn so much and, you know, and, and politicians in general are terrified of failure. So the fact that this allows things to go up and everybody gets to learn in a few hours and, and goes forward is an enormous uh, a contribution. Um, another key point here is, this is related to the prototype point, in a lot of cities, public art is a big formal process. It's juried and it's kind of permanent and it's a high bar and actually in this case, uh, it's, it's important to remind cities that this stuff too can just be temporary. Um, Deborah Cullen talks about that this is less public art but more a public art process and the Flux Foundation talks about the fact they don't make public art so much as they make public artists. So it's important to remind cities, hey, it's just a prototype. Here's this piece of art. It'll be up for a few weeks, a few months. You don't have to apply all those formal rules to it and then if they fall in love with it, you'll get there. Part of what I'm saying here is there's some policy stuff that's needed. We kind of need to get that word out. Um, Moxie, which is an artist collective uh, in Oakland, has done really interesting research on going off and trying to convince cities on how to um, you know, reduce the bar of, of bringing art in. Also, this whole constructability thing, how does a piece tear down and go up and move around? They also love shipping crates there, so they figured out how does art collapse down into standard containers and move on. So these are all kind of examples of, of that. Uh, another key thing is on this engagement stuff, it's so true and it really is difficult. I remember when the Exploratorium wanted to build a parklet in the mission and the reaction of a lot of the people in the mission was that's just more gentrification stuff and the Exploratorium was terribly disappointed because they do great work and then they hooked up with the Boys and Girls Club and they built, basically the Boys and Girls got engaged and built this science thing with the Exploratorium that was a parklet in the right part of, and it was everybody was learning and became, so that was an example of getting that kind of stuff right. And every city tends to have, some, the, you know, the key thing is if you're gonna go work in another city, go find the people who think like that. Like in Providence, there's a maker community called AS220 that are just thriving people like this. And if you went to uh, Cleveland, you'd find Thinkbox. And so that, that's, we did an urban prototyping thing in Singapore. And the question was, if you went to Singapore, um, would they even let you do this stuff? But when you found the art community, it worked out. So I, I don't wanna go on much longer, but the, the, this stuff that gets started here that in a way San Francisco's gotten incredibly good at because now the planning department has figured out what a great way to learn and evolve the city. It, it's kind of like Jane Jacobs talked about this in theory 50 years ago. She said, you know, you can't build a city unless everyone's engaged. And then you would think, how would you get everyone engaged? That's terribly difficult. And, and now we actually know how. And I think the big challenge for us now, and this is one of the reasons we're working on this book with the White House and a bunch of cities is, is to communicate how vital and possible this is and what a great way to proceed it is. So just thank you for all of you, both city community and burner community, for really leading the way in how people can do better, faster, engaging planning. Great, thank you so much. <coughs> check, 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 check. Can I get my mic on? There we go, great. <coughs> well, um, I noticed a thread with it, you know, throughout the day actually with toolkits and, one of the things that we're trying to achieve with this event is to gather information because we would like to do um, maybe a, uh, an entire weekend where we just talk about engineering and architecture, a, a weekend where we talk about legal and permits and all that kind of stuff. So we're hoping that all of you will give us feedback on the things that you've seen today and let us know what we missed, what you'd like to see us go deeper into because we were thinking if we could get the collective knowledge together that we could create a toolkit that would serve artists to help them get their work out in the world. But now I'm starting to realize that maybe we need a toolkit for cities to, to show them the way and how to work with artists. So maybe we have to do two. <laughs> um, so I'm very excited about this maker playbook. Um, and, and Can I throw something in there? Yeah, yeah. Um, I loved your example of partnering with the Boys and Girls Club or the YMCA yeah. and maybe a way, um, uh, sort of a new voice or a way to, can, uh, to add to that toolkit might be to find ways to consider how to work within either the nonprofit sector or within other neighborhood sector because I think that there are many um, ways in which opportunities like you mentioned um, could be 
brought forward and, and then we're sort of seeding uh, sort of the next generation. Yeah, and I would uh, add to that, that's awesome, that, that the, the rapidity that is um, so fruitful in any kind of prototyping process, when it, has to, when, it, when it matches up with communities who have very little to no trust in the way things have been decided for them, rapidity has to slow down in order for them to actually break down, the barrier to break down. And how do we afford the same kind of process for communities who do, are not engaged beyond art, just not engaged? And that, to me, is ultimately where we want to take tactical urbanism and engagement to a third place, right? Where everyone, afford, everyone is afforded the same, the same right to fail in their neighborhood to make it better and own it in the way that we can, right? Yeah. And, and a point to make here, the, the business of engaging communities that don't feel engaged or participatory is really tough, deep community organizing stuff, which is why you have to go find the people who are doing that because it's impossible to just show up right. and do that. That's exactly right. And then they can be your host and your guide to kind of how, how to make all this stuff happen. It's, <coughs> I, it's interesting, the, the one NEA grant that we got to work in Fernley, you, this is a town that's really kind of depressed economically and you know, there just isn't budget for art there. And um, in contrast to working here in San Francisco, I've gotten tax money from six different organizations within the city government for art. It's like almost every little uh, department has a little pocket, you know, hidden away for art. And if you know where to scratch, you can dig a little bit of that up. But um, you go into more depressed communities, there just isn't that money. Uh, yeah, that's actually, uh, you're right. Certainly in San Francisco, you can get um, everything from economic development to planning to Department of Children, Youth, and Family fund opportunities for artists. I think you had a session earlier today on funding opportunities. But I think that, that to that point, there are ways in which you can engage through the non-art sector, kind of what both of you have been talking about. That if you can find um, opportunities that low-income communities, um, communities of color, or communities that have historically felt disenfranchised from the whole political process, and it is slow, long-term, in-depth work, but I think that that's where the future of sort of art in cities exists. I think that's, if, if art is gonna survive citywide, um, because um, passion about, uh, about arts comes in waves with the, depending on who's in office and with whatever administration, and I think that the deeper the roots are within a community setting where artists are deeply embedded doing community work, the, the more stability and the long, kind of long-term opportunities. There are also, I think, alliances to be made. So when we did the first urban prototyping for which there wasn't a lot of money, I think maybe artists got a thousand dollar stipend and then most of them didn't, but did it anyway, there was a relationship with Tech Shop and Autodesk. So we kind of had a maker space and there was access to materials. And that making infrastructure is that much more mature now than a few years ago. So again, if you were to go into another city, a place like ASP20 in Providence, which both work with, I mean, they do an amazing job of bringing at-risk communities and just getting them thrilled and creating things, and they've got a great maker space. And you could just, you could go list cities that have that resource. That's probably a good hub that both has the technical ability to do things and the enthusiasm, and, and then to c connect out with communities. Well, we have an incredible brain trust up here, and I'd like to open it up to anybody who might have some questions for anybody up here. All right, we've answered every single question imaginable. <laughs> so the, the question was, um, are we drawing from other communities around the world and bringing back what we've learned um, in our own community? Um, I can say personally from, from my experience with Burning Man, that is definitely our intention. You know, as most of you know, Burning Man has regional groups all over the globe and, you know, we have a lot to learn from them. And every, you know, Burning Man event in different cities around the world has its own unique flavor. They don't want to be exactly like Burning Man. 
They want to fit their culture and their community. So our trip to Valencia was very much like, what can we learn from a city of a million people who have been burning effigies for over 300 years? Well, there's a lot to learn, as, we tur as it turns out. And as Dave X pointed out, as soon as a kid can pick up a firework, he's lighting fireworks. And you know, it's just so deeply in their culture. I, I walked up to this boy who had you know, the box. They have a box of fireworks. And so I pulled out a firework and handed it to him. And he went, oh, no, and he ran back. And I'm like, what? And his dad's like, oh, that's too big for him. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Well, let me see inside your box how big fireworks you've got. And he opens it up, and it's smoking. And he immediately took it and threw it off his shoulder onto the ground and ran away from it. And this is a, a little kid. Like, he couldn't talk much, but he, could, he knew what, the, what to do. And his dad's like, why is that smoking? And he had left his little punk, the thing that they used to light the fireworks, it fell into the box. And, but he knew to get away. So... Um, so yeah, I don't. I, I kind of went off on a tangent. <laughs> uh, in my practice, I have um, been very enriched by studying how people in other uh, countries and communities um, relate to public space a little bit differently. The role of public space in their community might be a little different, and then therefore the role of behavior and creative behavior and artistic behavior. Um, in public space may be a little different. Um, as an example, I was in Paris a few years ago, um, which arguably is the sort of cradle of urban intervention um, artwork. If you look back to the Situationist International, the Letterist International in the early late 50s, early 60s. Um, and I was talking to a, a teacher there, a guy who taught at the Sorbonne, and he said at the Sorbonne, there is a professional graduate degree in urban intervention, which is to say, uh, on the same level of getting a law degree or a business degree, it's a professional graduate degree in urban intervention. So just the way in which a, a country um, like France has sort of institutionalized all of these practices that we're talking about up here, um, which are sort of, you know, we're talking about ways in which these practices are subsumed uh, into, into government policies and government programs. Well, over there, it's been so subsumed that now there's degrees that you can get uh, in this type of practice. Uh, we have time for one more question. Ray Richman has a question. Oh, so the question was, given the fact that sometimes art is seen as uh, driving gentrification, how do we think about art in San Francisco given everything that's going on? Uh, I'll just give a, a quick thought on that. I think it, it often resolves to working tightly with the community so you're doing it with them and not at them. Um, and I think this group probably knows, are experts in that, but for example, in Market Street prototyping, which itself was delayed several months to work more closely with the community, the day it was deployed, a bunch of the people who lived in SROs in the Tenderloin came out and were like, well, no one consulted with us. And then they started giving us all these wonderful ideas of things that should be done. And then you and I, Jonathan, were talking the other night, and like now it's engaging with that group more. So I think a lot of it has to do with engaging and listening. Uh, but I'll turn it over to you guys because you're the experts. I, I'm on an advisory for a, a, a building going up. The art, the, the public art component of the a building on uh, Market Street, where the hall is. And it, it's an amazing conversation around what is considered, you know, community engagement art, socially engaged art. It's like, let's, you know, talk about, let's create art that's going to speak to the complications of living in Central Market. And I'm all for that on some level. And my response was, really? And people are supposed to go buy apartments for that. I said, why not think about all the assets that are in the Tenderloin? The enormous numbers of assets that exist inside of an area that you think has none. And I think by, by, by integrating into the actual systems that you can't even see on internet because they don't collectivize on an internet. They're not even working. But they're like the urban gardens, the number of urban gardens inside of the Tenderloin is astronomical. Why, and so to get people to understand and more, it was a great process, but the more people who make these decisions to understand how to learn about the assets of a neighborhood and how that actually is 
as authentic as speaking more so than speaking at a neighborhood's plight in some position that makes you feel good and does nothing for them, I think. There's a, a lot of funding these days for creative placemaking, right? Uh, there's a huge national grant program called Art Place. Uh, it's all about putting artists sort of at the tip of the spear of urban renewal or economic redevelopment of an area. Um, but I was happy to hear you say um, um, not just place making, but place enhancing or place keeping, because the whole the whole sort of premise of place making is that there's not a place there worthy of preserving, right? That we're going to come in and we're going to make a place through a set of artistic practices that then will eventually uh, result in, in economic redevelopment and often prices going up that will price out the artist that made it cool in the first place. Um, so, uh, you know, but at the same time, as a practicing artist, art place grants are six figures, some of them in the high six figures. So it's an incredible, incredible amount of money being made ava available to artists sort of on a level that is very rare um, for, for a practicing artist. But at the same time, uh, it, it may come with a cost, right? We're sort of instrumentalizing artists as sort of engines of economic redevelopment or engines of cultural development um, in a way that, uh, I don't know, to me is, is, is deeply problematic. Can, can I jump in there? Because I, I feel so, I agree with you. Um, there's a way in which sometimes artists are being used to band-aid the social ills of a city. Um, we are extremely fortunate in San Francisco right now. We have a very um, art-friendly board of supervisors. We have an art-friendly mayor. We live in, um, you know, we're going through a, a time when the city is doing well financially. Now, I can't advocate, but I can educate. And um, I do want you to know that there are many people in the community now who are working to increase arts funding. And the lens by which they are increasing arts funding is through the lens of neighborhood arts. They are looking to go back to the model that my program was based on, the, the original neighborhood arts program, because they know that, that the, the, if, they're, if they're gonna go before the voters and get city votes, it can't be about artists' as gentrification. It has to be about artists doing deep community engagement, neighborhood by neighborhood, place by place, thereby supporting and sustaining our arts community, but also sustaining and, and um, strengthening our neighborhoods. Great, thank you. All right, with that, I think we'll, we'll wrap this up. Um, thank you again, Judy Nemsoff, Jonathan Moscone, Matthew Passmore, and Peter Hirschberg. <laughs>